वेलकम टू यूपीजी पाठशाला आई एम डॉक्टर मृन्मय प्रामाणिक आई टीच कम्पेटिव इंडियन लैंगुएज एंड लिटरेचर एट द यूनिवर्सिटी ऑफ कैलकाटा टुडे वी विल डिस्कस ऑन कॉन्टेम्प्रेरी इंडियन पोलिटिक्स दिस इज अ मॉड्यूल फ्रॉम द पेपर इंडियन एस्थेटिक्स देर इज अ जेनरल एग्रीमेंट एमंग स्कॉलर्स दैट इंडियन पोलिटिक्स शुड बी अंडरस्टूड टू हैव बिगन फ्रॉम भारत एज नाट्य शास्त्र वन ऑफ द प्राइमरी रीजन्स फॉर दिस ह्यूज इम्पॉर्टेंस अटैच टू नाट्य शास्त्र इन द स्टाडी ऑफ इंडियन पोलिटिक्स इज ऑल्सो बिकॉज देर इज नो अदर एक्सटैंड एग्जाम्पल अवेलेबल टू आस मैंशनिंग लिटरी राइटिंग बिफोर दिस द वर्क वॉज लेटर कॉमेंटेड एग्जॉस्टिवली बाय फोर कॉमेंटेटर्स Unfortunately, apart from Ananda Vardhanas or Abhinava Gupta's Abhinava Bharati, rest are lost. It is interesting to note here that Natya Shastra was not a text about literature, though the work was meant to be a manual for the actors and directors in a performance. According to Bharata, the central purpose. of dramatic performance as a work of art is rasa or aesthetic emotion which is its soul his entire theory is focused to discuss how artists and directors associated with a performance can ensure the construction and enactments of this soul since without rasa the performance is supposed to be lifeless these are several rules prescribed by varata ensuring its presence in a performance however although focused primarily on performance in discussing vachika vinaya where enactment is through words varata discusses different aspects of literary writing as well he mentions that good diction must fulfill ten conditions of good writing one is gunas abstain from ten faults doshas and maintain certain literary characters or lakshanas he lists 36 of these characters and discusses the use of literary figures or alamkaras which separate literary from other kind of writing however bharata does not only discuss literary writing along with performance he goes on to discuss music dance different styles of Uh, enactment also in dealing with literary writing along with performance music dance among other forms of art varata also constructs his idea that the whole gamut of aesthetic experience which can be perceived by the eye and the ear or human consciousness in general should be driven by similar rules ensuring production of rasa the production of rasa by various means should be the sole goal of any work of aesthetics be it literature be it music be it painting or be it dance in this sense it is the only grand text on aesthetics in the indian tradition all else flow from it and can be considered its uh, bhashyas or commentaries given natya shastra's grand stature because of it being the only available text from ancient times discussing aesthetics in its totality most of the discussion of indian poetics afterwards revolved around production of rasa through various means theoreticians different in their concepts about origins of rasa but their goals rarely deviated from what bharata prescribed about importance of rasa as the central purpose of a work of art as the years progressed uh, towards the contemporary times the scholars working on indian poetics have often gone to the extent of mixing the secular and the sacred bringing rasa to understand contemporary socio political realities of india in literature many have also tried to with the western literary and cultural theoretical postulations with bharata's concepts or his commentators 
concept for instance Obhinav Gupta's postulations about Dhwani to produce an Indian poetics in the contemporary times. A similar overview emerges when one looks at some of the major scholars of Indian poetics of the recent past, some critics and their concepts. Aurobindo and A.K. Kumar Swami belong not only to the category of cultural critics, it is with them that the tradition of philosophical hermeneutics begins in the Indian English literary criticism. The telic universe of Aravinda's work of art is a conceptive extension of God as time and space. The work of art is the figural body of God visualized as universal rhythm. It appropriates and assimilates the cosmicity of God against the nullity and void of existence. Aurobindo's aesthetic theory grows out of body plexus symbolism where he has a scheme of eight levels of ascent and descent. Each form is peculiar to its own level of existence, corporeal and mental qualities and state of consciousness. Aurobindo has a four-tier hierarchy of his basic structure, mental vital, giving expression by thought and speech to sensations emotions and other volitions of the physical being, the emotional vital, which is the seat of love, joy, sorrow, hatred, etc. The central vital, which houses ambition, pride, fear, etc., which are stronger emotions, the lower vital, which is full of small desires, sexual hunger, etc. The artwork provides knowledge by identity, knowledge, by direct observation, knowledge by completely separative means without direct contact. Anand Kumar Swami <laughs> regarded art history as the history of the human spirit and art as rooted in life. Divorced from life, art becomes mere uh, mechanical architectonics uh, and open to corruptions from industry and degradation in values. Kumar Swami's critical principles are based upon his study of Hindu sculpture, art, painting, religion, and philosophy. Kumar Swami believed that art has little to do with personal self-expression. He emphasized the use of universal symbols, works of art, imitate divine forms, and are rituals to that purpose. Beauty leads to that process of self-discovery in knowledge and goodness. The poetic form is identical with the soul element. Function and meaning cannot be forced apart. The meaning of the work of art is its intrinsic form um, as much as the soul is the form of the body. Meaning is even prior to utilitarian application. Imitation Kumar Swami regarded as the embodiment in matter of a preconceived form. Nature is only the material body, the essence being provided by the spirit. Forms have a divine origin, be it painting, architecture, music, literature. They follow a cosmic pattern that images the Leela of God. Professor C.D. Narasimhan's basic canon is the assimilation of the best both from the Indian as well as the Western traditions critical and creative. His has been a lifelong search for the common poetic, the principles that uh, minimize the differential in favor of the common and the unitary. Narasimhaya adopted the historical and comparative method, believing in the uh, close textual analysis. Influences on Narasimhaya are clearly those of his guru, F. L. Lewis, Arnold, Eliot, and others. He regards Indian literature in English as part of Indian literature written in different languages. The Indianness of the tradition means a continuity of the artworks links with the Vedas, Upanishads, Mahabharata, Ramayana, Puranas, among other central texts. Narasimhaya laments the gradual 
Americanization of the Indian intellectual. Bikram Sheth and Sasi Tharoor, for example, whose novels come in uh, for a severe attack. Narasimhaya is also not very happy with terms like post-colonialism and post-modernism since they posit a locus that may be radical in a negative sense. Professor K. R. Srinivas Iyengar and M. K. Nayak are other important figures within contemporary Indian poetics. Iyengar avoids doctrinaire approach and advocates for an open mind which is neither impatient nor ready to condemn. Iyengar combines literary criticism with literary historicism. Commenting upon Commonwealth literature, Iyengar said that it should be considered as a unity, even a spiritual force, for it is only in the writer that the integrity of the character is visible. It is this integrity which, by the use of the inspired word, can redeem the world. M. K. Nayak began as a critic by writing on the novels of Mulkraj Anand, Narayan, Raja Rao, Somerset Mom, and the poetry of T. S. Eliot. Nayak's basic approach is historical and formal. His book Mirror on the World surveys British fiction on India. Nayak stands for art to be rooted in a specific soil. Nike belongs to the tradition of Arnold as far as historicism is concerned. Nike holds, like Raja Rao, that we cannot write like English, we should not. He pleads for an understanding of India's rich critical traditions by the practicing Indian critic in towards an aesthetic of Indian English literature. At the same time, he is not hesitant of taking the best from the Western critical tradition. M. Hiriyana's art experience and K. C. Pandey's comparative aesthetics are two other contemporary concepts that should be mentioned. While Hiriyana's book is influenced by his history of Indian philosophy, K. C. Pandey's two volumes provide knowledge of the traditions of the West. Krishnarayan's name in applying the central tenets of Sanskrit poetics upon works in English and other Indian languages stand singularly distinct. Krishna Ryan's four books on poetry, Suggestion and Statement in Poetry, University of London Press, 1972, Text and Subtext, New Delhi, Arnold, 1987, The Burning Bush, New Delhi, DK Publication, 1988, and Sahitya, A Theory, New Delhi, Starling, 1998 make um, Ryan a very formidable contemporary critic. In preface to the first book, Ryan makes it clear that he is neither writing an exposition of Sanskrit poetics nor discussing English critical theory. His task has mainly been centered on providing theoretical critical models for Indian scholars. Ryan relates his concept of suggestion to I. Richards emotive meaning, William Emson's ambiguity, Clint Brooks' irony, Tate's intention, Ransom's texture, and Blackmoor's gesture. In his book Text and Subtext in 1987, Ryan looked at the theory of suggestion and tried to establish the suggestion. The production of unstated subsurface indirect multiple emotive meaning was what distinguished modern literature from the literature of earlier periods. Ryan examined texts like Alfred Tennyson's Beckett alongside T.S. Eliot's Murder in the Cathedral, Christopher Fryer's um, Cutmantle and Jean Anuel's Beckett Au El Hanuya De Dieu. Four of Thomas Hardy's novels exploring the notion of a return to the roots were um, were analyzed in relation to novels by Margaret Drabble that pursue a similar theme. The book Text and Subtext also looks at the practice of suggestion and evocation in Milton's Paradise Lost and the poetry of W. B. Yeats and the minimalist micro-suggestive uh, poetic practice of the review poets. 
The critic quoted critical passages from Western theories to relate the theory of suggestion to symbolist practice as well as to the Sanskrit concept of Rasadhvani. He also considered the binary oppositions like emotive referential meaning. According to I. Richards, oblique, direct of e e M. W. Tilliard, local textual logic structure of J. C. Ransom, and intensive extensive meaning Alan Tate to be uh, renamings of the suggestion statement distinction found in Eastern as well as Western poetics. In this book, literariness is understood as suggested meanings. The poems of Keats, Yeats, and Milton are examined in terms of the doctrine of suggestiveness. Historical approach is important in so far as it is relevant in tracing the evolution of images, symbols, and other tropes of language. In the postscript to text and subtext, Ryan says that the poetic of suggestion will be concerned with the work's meaning defined as consisting its formal order in the way the work employs its uh, presentational unity, the image and the scene functioning with the same presentational immediacy and determining the ontological identity of the work. Now let us talk about traditional Indian poetics in contemporary times. First, let us look on problems. At the risk of sounding somewhat generalistic, one can say that often many Indian literature texts have tried uh, to say, tried to say within Natya Shastra's tenets about how moral uh, precepts are to be kept in mind while writing Natya Shastra's conclusion that performance should teach, but through entertainment and delight has often been one of the goals of writers within Indian literature. Written in different languages, although without ruling out exceptions and experiments, experimentations, and a criticism based on rasa, alamkara, dhani, um, ochitta theory worked successfully uh, with uh, those texts in trying to answer the question, what is the essence of a successful performance? Natya Shastra suggests the communication of aesthetic emotions or rasa and then goes on to look at the mechanism of communication of aesthetic emotion briefly. A similar tendency to judge a literary piece of writing on the basis of its capacity to convey the soul and the spirit by critics can be seen in the discussion above about some of them. For a long time, such an emphasis on essence, uh, rasa, dhvani, spirit within Indian literary criticism made sense comfortably for many of us. However, things get complex afterwards and such theories seem too simplistic to understand the complicatedness of times we witness. For instance, after post-colonialism or post-modernism, while these are interesting experiments, the method can work fully only in a stable static culture with a lot of received assumptions and capable of a large number of um, shared responses. The theory of rasas is also too limited and rigid to make it critically effective when applied to modern text where uh, the boundaries of emotions are blurred, the moods are in a flux and the response is more complex. Behind these theories is a whole static worldview and a fixed view of literature and literariness. They have also a tendency detached from its time and society. Both classical Sanskrit and Tamil poetics therefore fail to historicize their text and themselves need to be historicized to be understood concepts. Like Dhvani and Auchitto or propriety and the linguistic injunctions against Aslila or Obscene, Gramya or Rustic and Chuta Shamaskara or Ankaut can hardly be isolated from the class that generated uh, them and hence do not apply to several subaltern forms and movements. Both ancient and modern, in the wake of a wide dissemination of the Western literary theory, 
It is also possible to appreciate many of the ancient texts or non-normative subaltern texts in different periods for their radical energy. The radicalism built in this text seems much more complex than what Rasa or Dhani or Alamkara theory allows us to envision. The traditional concepts of Pratibha or genius, Sahridaya, the competent reader, the Sahityaya, the fixed togetherness of the word and the meaning compared to the bond of Parvati Parameshwara. As something deposited in the work by the author and the authorial institution itself emerged from an idealist philosophical premise. The concept of the reader as the producer of meaning of the text as a flux and the absence of the eternal uh, difference, differing of a final meaning. Literariness itself as the effect of reading and the historical and ideological determinations of the text are alien to this aesthetic ideology. Then next is response to this criticism of uh, ancient Indian poetics in contemporary times. As a response to this inadequacy of Bharata's Natya Shastra, a traditional Indian poetics in general, there are two tendencies that one finds in contemporary Indian poetics. One is an attempt to reinterpret rasa, dhvani, auchitta, alamkara, etc. in light of contemporary realities, blending it with the western cultural theories. Satchidanandan calls this response a form of enlightened revivalism, which has been an attempt to extend, develop and reinterpret traditional poetics in order to apply its concepts to modern texts and genres. At times incorporating the concepts of western poetics in the process, another tendency is to borrow the western literary and cultural postulations to analyze. Indian literature written in English and other languages. The influence of Western criticism was evident from the very beginning of modern criticism in India, which emerged along with the new genres like the short story, the novel and the modern prose play. If initially it was only English criticism that influenced Indian critics, later Russian, French, German schools also began to have their impact. This began chiefly with the emergence of Marxist and Freudian analytical models. Sidney and Arnold had uh, held sway for some time in liberal Indian criticism. Later they were replaced by Eliot and I. Richards. This happened especially during the emergence of modern poetry, which came to be associated with Eliot's modes and mores. In recent past, there is a further shift within the contemporary poetics with critics like Minakshi Mukherjee criticizing the ideological project of English in the world and nativizes or nativizing the vital components of this project making literature grow from other than English sources. Now let us sum up on the whole discussion. In this chapter we saw how Bharata's Natya Shastra and its rasa, rasa theory, remained a wide influence over Indian poetics for long. We also saw how during the 19th century, when Indian landscape witnessed a huge change, the rasa, dhvani, alamkara, riti, dosa, guna, auchitya, etc. proved inadequate to successfully appreciate the new forms of literary writings that came to the fore. Since then, contemporary Indian poetics have been trying to come to terms with this gap. We also briefly discussed the two major tendencies within contemporary poetics to respond to this gap. The history of Indian criticism in the past few decades has been the history of the varied responses uh, to these challenges and the attempts to arrive at the at some critical canon that might help unlock and explain contemporary Indian text. Thank you.